This is the city, Los Angeles, California. The people here, like anywhere else, put in a hard day. After work, they want to get home. It can take 10 minutes or two hours. Once there, they like to unwind. They can go out to one of 560 movie theaters. For those who can't get a babysitter, there are 27 drive-ins. This is the city of the drive-in. Supermarkets, restaurants, dry cleaners, even banks. There are drive-in car washes, 125 of them. Life in Los Angeles is fast and convenient. It's a great place to live. I try to help keep it that way. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. First, it was clear in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. The boss is Captain Hugh Brown. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Bill looked like he was practicing yoga. All right, I'll ask, what are you doing? Oh, I was just practicing the paradox and tension method. The what? The paradox and tension method. You mean you never heard of it? Well, I can't say as I have. It's very scientific. It's a new method of curing insomnia. What's with the arms? Oh, well, see, you raise your left arm like this. Then you say, my arm is heavy, heavy, heavy. And then you raise your right arm like this, and you say, my arm... Oh, that isn't necessary. I'm not going to do it now, Joe. Then you raise your left leg, and your right leg, and around the clock. And then what happens? Well, I just told you, pretty soon your arms and legs get heavier and heavier, and the next thing you know, you're sound asleep. Let me ask you one thing. Sure. You just got to work, pal. How come you're trying to go to sleep? Well, that's where the paradox intention comes in. The theory is that if you try to go to sleep, you'll stay awake and vice versa. I see. That's why it's called the paradox intention method. That's why it's called that. If you try to do one thing, you'll do just the opposite. It's a paradox, Joe. Does it work? Well, sure it works. It's very scientific, you know. Then how come you're yawning? You should have had a good night's sleep. Didn't you try your method last night? Oh, yeah, I tried it. Didn't work, huh? No, it worked fine. The only trouble was it took all night to make it work. Two people shot, man and a woman. Draft girl printing plant in West Vernon. SID's on the way. Right. Looks like a sniper. 9.22 a.m. Grafco is a big plant in the May Park area. They print weekly newspapers and big circulation magazines. The payroll is about 200. 9.37 a.m., we arrived at Grafco. The personnel manager showed us the employment records of both victims. Fred Keller was a foreman, a family man. He got along with everybody. Barbara Hill was a secretary. She was well-liked. She had a fiancé overseas in the Air Force. 9.40 a.m., we talked to Frank Romero, the plant manager. He knew of no reason why anyone might have wanted to kill either of the victims. There were no witnesses. It appeared both victims were entering the building when they were shot. You don't know of any quarrels the victims might have had, any bad blood with the other employees? No, none. I can't believe anybody who works here could do a thing as horrible as this. Mr. Romero, we'd like to have the names of any of your employees who didn't show up for work this morning. Well, you think it was one of my employees? It's a place to start. Yes, of course. I'll get the timesheets. Thank you. I tell you, this has me all shook up. Two people shot down in cold blood. I suppose you people see a lot of this sort of thing. You're used to it. No, sir. You never get used to it. Frank Romero came up with the names of six absentees. We checked them out. They all could account for their whereabouts at the time of the double murder. There was nothing to do now but begin the tedious job of checking out every man and woman on the Grafco payroll. We worked all day and into the night. Wednesday, 10.05 a.m., Bill and I checked back in after a short night's sleep. We had worked half the night at Grafco without turning a single lead. The bodies of both shooting victims were posted. Two slugs were removed from the male victim's head and one from an almost identical location in the female victim. The slugs were sent up to ballistics for identification. Captain, Joe. 
Ballistics report, murder weapon was a 22 caliber rifle. Homicide, Helder. Yeah, for you, Joe. Thank you. Miss Friday. Yes, sir. I see. Uh-huh. All right, thank you, Mr. Romero. We're on our way. It's one of the foremen out at Grafco. He remembers a beef between the male victim, Fred Keller, and some kid, a college boy who works part-time. Yeah. Kid didn't show up for work yesterday, but nobody bothered to mark it down. 10.28 a.m. The foreman was named Al Souza. He said the boy who didn't show up Tuesday morning was named Jeff Buckram, 18 years old, a student at May Park Junior College. He's kind of a flunky, Sergeant. He only works part-time when he hasn't got a class in college, and nobody remembered it was his day on, I guess. You say he had a quarrel with Keller. It wasn't much, hardly anything. Two weeks ago, the kid fired up one of the big rotary presses. He's not supposed to even touch it. Keller jumped him, not too hard. Kid had it coming. It's dangerous fooling around with a big press like that. But the kid blew. He sort of turned white-like and doubled up his fist and started moving at Keller. What happened then? Nothing. One or two of the boys told him to cool it, and Keller just shrugged and said, take it easy, kid, or something like that. And that was it? Yeah, Keller walked away. Kid just stood there with his knuckles white, and everybody left him alone. All right, thank you, Mr. Souza. Well, I'm sorry, Sergeant, about not remembering yesterday, I mean. Kid like that, nobody ever seems to miss him. Maybe that's what he didn't like. <laughs> Frank Romero, the manager, gave us a copy of Jeff Buckram's personnel card with his home address, but he said we'd probably find the boy at school. He also gave us a good description of Jeff. 10.42 a.m., we drove over to May Park Junior College. 11.03 a.m., we checked with the registrar. Jeff Buckram was scheduled for an English class from 10 to 11 a.m. We decided to talk to his instructor. His English teacher was Ann Tipton. Oh, you didn't miss Jeff. He was absent today. I knew something must be wrong. Why do you say that, Miss Tipton? He's never absent. What is it anyway? What's Jeff done? Would you know the names of any of his friends? No, Jeff spends most of his time alone. He's a very dedicated student, perhaps too dedicated. How's that, Miss Tipton? It's just a phase he's in, I suspect. He's a very sensitive young man, rather a poet. He's trying very hard to be an existentialist at the moment. He's 18, but he's still an adolescent. It's not a very good combination, adolescence and existentialism. What do you mean by existentialism? If you don't know, don't worry, Mr. Gannon. Nobody else knows either. It's sort of an anti-philosophy, really. Existentialists don't agree with each other about anything, even about being existentialists. But they do seem to have one thing in common. What's that? I'd say they're preoccupied with the darker side of life. The darker side? Meaning what, Miss Tipton? Oh, aggression, violence, fear, death. And there's one sort of central thing. What's that? They believe one should live one's philosophy, not just think about it. Yes, ma'am. One must act. Eleven thirty-two a.m. Jeff Buckram lived in a small two-story apartment with the usual palm trees out front. A weary-looking woman answered the door. She said she was Jeff Buckram's aunt, Ada Beale. We identified ourselves, and she asked us in. What do you want with Jeff? He's never had any trouble with the police. You want to ask him some questions? Well, he's in his room with his nose in the book, as usual. I've raised that boy since his folks was killed eight years ago, but I never taught him to read trash like that. As God is my judge, I didn't. What kind of trash is that, Miss Beale? Flowers of evil, that's what it is. Baudelaire, you should hear him spout that stuff. It's profane, if you ask me, enough to drive the Lord right out of this house. Aunt Ada thinks that all literature stops with the Bible. Anything else is blasphemous. Uh, are you cops? Jeff Buckram. That's right. What have I done? Did Aunt Ada turn me in for reading Baudelaire? This is Officer Gannon. My name's Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. We're investigating a shooting at the Grafco plant yesterday morning. Two people killed. Yes, I heard about it on the radio. Aunt Ada's radio. I hate radios myself all day long, that hideous outpouring of vulgarity. You weren't at work yesterday morning, Jeff. You mind telling us where you were? Right here in my room, with my friend Flaubert. Flaubert? Oh, yes. Flaubert. It's another one of them flowers of evil. You know Flaubert, officer? A passing acquaintance. Well, this is where I was all day yesterday. Right here, deep in the cesspools of French literature. Can you verify that, Mrs. Beale? Well, no, not directly, I can't. I wasn't home. But he was here, all right. Jeff never lies, even if his mind is poisoned against the Lord. I was at work. I'm a housekeeper odd days. It's the only kind of work the Lord fitted me to do. Any special reason why you didn't go to work yesterday or to school today? I I'm in pain. Is that so? 
Yes, I took a line drive on the Shin Monday. Baseball practice. I'm a pitcher. College team? That's right. May Park Junior College Pirates. <laughs> now, how is that for vulgarity? We understand you knew Fred Keller, is that right? That scum, illiterate scum. Oh, God forgive us. Now you see what I mean, officers. We understand you had a quarrel with Fred Keller two weeks ago. Tell us about it. A quarrel? You switched on one of the presses you weren't supposed to touch, isn't that it? Keller was arrogant. All right. Do you own a 22 caliber rifle? A rifle? But do you want to search the place? Or would that prejudice your case? For now, we're just asking, Jeff. All right, you asked. Do you own a rifle? Am I under arrest? No, you're not. Well, all right, then I'll tell you the truth. No, I do not own a rifle. Anything else I can do for you? Yeah. Stay home and take care of that sore leg. What do you think? I think he's lying. So do I. There's somebody who might fill in a few blank spots for us. Oh, well, we already talked to his English teacher. When you want to find out about a boy, you don't talk to his English teacher. Is that right? You talk to his baseball coach. 11.45 a.m., we spoke to Jeff Buckram's baseball coach, Jake Mahler. Says he got a shin bruise at practice, Monday. Yes, sir. This Monday. That's what he says. Jeff Buckram hasn't suited up for two weeks. Told me he had to quit baseball, so we dropped him from the squad. What can you tell us about the boy? I never could figure him out, really. I don't know why he came out for baseball in the first place. He didn't seem to have the normal motivation. How do you mean? No team spirit. He didn't care about anybody else. Like, the team didn't exist. The only time he looked alive was when he was batting or pitching. The rest of the time he sat on the bench, usually reading a book. What kind of books would you know? You mean the titles? Yes, sir, that's right. Well, I wouldn't have any idea. All I can say is they weren't comic books. Was he any good, coach? Any good? How do you mean? Well, did he have any baseball talent? Was he a starter? Yeah, he had the makings of a pretty fair pitcher. Good arm, aggressive, great fastball. That wasn't quite enough, though. How do you mean? Control. He'd go ape under any kind of pressure. He'd been the boy a couple of months back. I still don't know if he meant to or not. Like I told you, he could throw a ball like a bullet, but you never could be sure who or what he's going to throw it at. When Jeff said he was quitting, did he give a reason? All I remember is he said he had to work longer hours, earn more money. Did he say what he wanted the money for? Said he wanted to buy himself a rifle. I asked him if he was going hunting. What did he say to that? He just looked right through me and said, maybe I am. I sure hope he can aim a rifle better than any can of baseball. Maybe he can. <laughs> p.m. By now, we had probable cause for Jeff Buckram's arrest. We went downtown for arrest and search warrants and drove back to Jeff's apartment. Oh, it's you. Jeff ain't home. Gone. Not here. How long has he been gone? Packed up and run off the minute you folks left. Did he say where he was headed? He didn't even say, God bless me. He took my car. I couldn't stop him. Now, how am I going to get around without a car? Did he take a gun with him, a rifle? A gun? There's never been a gun in this house, Mr. Policeman. What kind of car do you drive? What kind? Blue. A Ford. A blue Ford. What model? Model? What year's the car? Well, I bought it secondhand. I don't know how old it well, is. Well, do you know the license number? How would I know that? It isn't even paid for yet. Better get out an APB. I'll use the phone in the hall. Right. Now, Mrs. Beale, do you have any idea where your nephew is? I know what you're talking about, officer. I heard you ask about that shooting, and you think Jeff did it. Yes, ma'am. We have a warrant for his arrest. It's all over. I tried. Lord knows I tried. The devil is in this house. That boy, he talked with the devil. There, that book right where he left it. He tore a page out before he threw it there on the table. Would you know why? Just tore a page out and stuffed it in his pocket and left this house. I wouldn't know. I never read evil books. We'd like to take the book with us, Mrs. Beale. It'll be returned after we finish our investigation. Don't you bring it back here. I beg your pardon? It belongs to the public library. Return it to them if you want. We'll do that. Maybe you won't. How's that? It's overdue. You'll have to pay a fine. <laughs> gave the apartment a thorough search. We failed to turn any kind of weapon. Before we left, we requested that the Buckram apartment be placed under surveillance. 1.55 p.m., the APB went out on Jeff Buckram and the Blue Ford. The only thing we had to go on was the book. We drove over to the branch library Jeff had checked it out from. The senior librarian was Alice Philbin. We 
talk to her in the coffee room. I don't like to receive visitors in the main room. It's difficult enough to maintain quiet without our setting a bad example. Yes, ma'am. Miss Philbin, do you know a Jeff Buckram? Jeff Buckram? Yes, I do. He's one of our best customers. Here's a book he borrowed. I believe it's one of yours. Oh, yes, Flaubert. It's overdue, Sergeant. There's a page missing. Page 67. It's been torn out. That's not like Jeff. How do you mean? Well, he loves books. Overdue, yes, that's Jeff. But vandalism, no. We'd like to know what was on that page. Can you help us? Well, I know you haven't come here just to return an overdue book and report a torn page. Jeff Buckram's in some kind of trouble. What is it? We'd like to talk to him. Do you have another copy of that book? Yes, I believe we do have one more copy. If it's in, I'll check. We'd appreciate that. It's probably on the shelf. Flaubert isn't very big in this neighborhood. I was right. It's funny you should tear this particular page out. How's that, ma'am? It's about a boy who loves to kill things. Yes, ma'am. He starts out killing a little mouse, and finally he kills his father and mother. This is page 67. I'll read it to you. One morning, as he was going back along the curtain wall, he saw a fat pigeon on the top of the rampart preening itself in the sun. Julian stopped to look at it, and as there was a breach in this part of the wall, a fragment of stone lay ready to his hand. He swung his arm, and the stone brought down the bird, which fell like a lump into the moat. He dashed down after it, tearing himself in the briars and scouring everywhere, nimbler than a young dog. The pigeon, its wings broken, hung quivering in the boughs of a privet. The obstinate life in it annoyed the child. He began to throttle it, and the bird's convulsions made his heart beat, filled him with a savage, passionate delight. When it stiffened for the last time, he felt that he would swoon. Thank you very much, Miss Philbin. Gentlemen. Yes, ma'am. Don't judge too soon. How do you mean? Do you know how it turns out, the Flaubert story? No, ma'am, we don't. It's one of his most famous short pieces. In the end, despite all he's done wrong, the boy turns out to be very good. Is that right? Oh, yes. It's the legend of St. Julian. <laughs> Two forty-six p.m. We checked with the office. There were no results on the APB. Bill and I drove back to May Park Junior College. We wanted to talk to Ann Tipton again, Jeff Buckram's English teacher. She said she was familiar with the legend of Saint Julian. Oh yes, I'm familiar with the legend of Saint Julian. It's regarded as one of the most lucid and graphic stories ever written on the joy of killing. Was this a particular favorite story of Jeff Buckram's? I'm no psychiatrist, believe me. I guess I've been trying to talk like one. I'm really nothing but a junior college English teacher and a rather frightened one at that. Well, why is that? I'm frightened for Jeff Buckram. And I'm afraid for Nancy Morton, too. Nancy Morton? Now, who's she? You might say she's Jeff's girlfriend, but I don't know that she'd agree with you. What do you mean by that? I doubt if Jeff has had much experience with sex. He's rebelling against everything, including sex, I imagine. He needs somebody to lean on, to idealize. Well, now, why didn't you tell us about the Morton girl before? I didn't think it was important before, and I just didn't want to get anyone involved. Now I'm beginning to get concerned for Nancy. Why is that? I think Jeff's trying to escape into some fantasy world, but he can't quite go it alone. He wants to take somebody with him. Something else about that world of his. Yes, ma'am? It must be a very dark place. Nancy Morton wasn't at school. We got her home address from the registrar's office. She appeared nervous, but she asked us in when we said we wanted to talk about Jeff Buckram. What is it? Is Jeff in some kind of trouble? We'd like to ask you a few questions, Miss Morton. How well do you know Jeff Buckram? He's just a friend. I'm not sure what the relationship is, really. We're not that friendly. What is it, anyway? What's happened to Jeff? We're trying to locate him, Miss Morton. Now, did you and Buckram spend much time together? No, nothing like that. He's never even tried to kiss me. He's just somebody I know, that's all. Is that so? I suppose every red-blooded college girl expects to be made a pass at sooner or later. Jeff's just different, that's all. How's he different? He just wants to talk or sit and look at me or out the window. He recites poetry sometimes, although I admit it's pretty gloomy stuff. You know, Baudelaire, Rambo, that stuff. We met in English Lit. He isn't too bad-looking, and he seems so intellectual. When did you see him last? Just a few minutes before you arrived. Where'd he go? I don't know. He didn't say. Did he seem nervous or upset? 
No, I didn't notice anything special. He's always sort of different. I wish you'd tell me what we're talking about. Has Jeff done something? We'd like to ask him some questions. Have you any idea where he might be? Any places he's known to frequent? Any friends he might visit? I don't know of any of his friends or even if he has any. I see. He seems so helpless, like he had to have somebody to be near. But he didn't want any involvement. It was like he wanted somebody to own, but he didn't want anybody to own him or even touch him. All he believed in was people and books, people that don't exist. He believed in ideas that didn't have anything to do with anything real, anything in his own life. It was like he lived in a world made up of other people's words. All right, Miss Morton, thank you. You've been very helpful. Now, we just have one more question for you. Why did Buckram stop by here this afternoon? Do I have to tell you? Yes, ma'am, you do. He stopped by to pick up something. What was it? A gun. What kind of a gun? I don't know. I don't know anything about them. Did he get it? Yes. Can you tell us what the gun looked like? Was it a rifle, a pistol? It was a rifle. I know that much. Do you know what caliber? Caliber? That's the diameter of the bore. Now, did he say what caliber it was? I don't know. What could he have said? What would it sound like? Well, 30, 30, 30 aught six. Yes. He said 22. Does that mean anything? 4.15 p.m., Bill and I went back to the office. Nancy Morton's home was placed under surveillance. Homicide, Gannon. Yeah, he's right here. This Friday. Yes, Miss Philbin. No, don't go near him. If he starts to leave, try and stall him. Leave him alone. That's right, we're on our way. Jeff Buckram, he's at the library. We drove as fast as the traffic would allow across town to the May Park Branch Library. Cops in a library? Aren't you out of your milieu? You're under arrest for murder. I've been patient too long. My memory is dead. All fears and all wrongs to the heavens have fled, while all my veins burst with a sickly thirst. That's Rimbaud, officer. And these are your rights. Listen to them. You have the right to remain silent. Murder? The right to remain I had silent. no idea, Sergeant. Do you think Flaubert was the reason? No, ma'am, right not the reason. Attorney, just the excuse. Ada Beale's car was found in an alley near the library. The 22 caliber rifle was in the trunk. It was checked out and confirmed by SID as the murder weapon. Jeff Buckram said he didn't want a lawyer. He shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done what? Torn that page out. That was wrong. So's murder. Flaubert wasn't right, you understand. He didn't really know. Is that so? It wasn't like that at all. Wasn't like what? Like he said, full of delight. Savage and passionate delight. I didn't feel anything like that at all. What did you feel? I felt scared, like when you break something, something that belongs to somebody else. And you know you gotta get caught, and you gotta get punished. I guess I'll never make it, will I? Make what? I guess I'll never be a saint like Julian and Flaubert. You got a long way to go. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 16th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The jury found the suspect guilty on two counts of first degree murder. Murder in the first degree is punishable by death or confinement in the state prison for life.